Hi everyone, thanks for coming to our talk on private collecting, motivations, tastes and narratives. We have today uh, speakers, Dr. Shaolo, Dr. Wee Wahono and Lu Soon, moderated by Sharanjit Lail. I'm going to very quickly introduce the speakers and then let them begin the discussion. Um, our moderator, Sharanjit Lail, is a Singaporean producer and presenter for BBC World News. She regularly anchors Asia Business Report and Newsday from the BBC Singapore studio. She's also a reporter and producer on these shows along with Business World Business Report. Previously, she was with Bloomberg Television, where she reported on breaking financial stories as well as major news events. From our left, we have Lu Xun, who lives and works in Nanjing, China. He is a collector of contemporary Chinese and international art. In 2013, he founded the new Sifang Art Museum, designed by the renowned American architect Stephen Hall. He currently sits on the board of acquisition committee of the Tate Modern and is a founding member of Delfina Foundation's Asia Pacific Committee. And we have Dr. Cheryl Lowe, who is one half of the art collecting duo that forms the Dr. John and Cheryl Chia collection. She and her husband, Dr. John, are committed collectors with a collection comprising around 300 contemporary works from around Asia. As a couple, they're part of a new group of art collectors in Southeast Asia whose activities are enlarging the reach of contemporary artist practices beyond the studio and gallery. Lastly, we have Dr. Wiyu Wahono, who has been named a leading cultural engineer of the contemporary scene and is one of the earliest and most significant collectors of cutting-edge contemporary art. He is a member of the Art Stage Jakarta Board of Young Collectors, the Singapore Art Fair Honorary Board of Patrons, and the Jury for the Bandung Contemporary Art Awards. Please give a warm applause to our speakers. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Um, as you heard, these are some amazing collectors here on stage uh, with us. Uh, we're very honored to have them here. And I'm very honored to uh, be moderating as well. As you heard, I'm, I, my background's in financial journalism. You know, what the hell do I know about art? But I have done a couple of stories about investing in art and why people should care about the art world. And, uh, you know, this is a really interesting uh, session because we're talking about private collecting motivations, tastes, and narratives. So, you know, these are really big words. I want to get a sense of what your motivations, tastes, and narratives are, but I'm going to start with a really, really simple question, uh, which is a question that I think will inform the rest of our discussion this hour. And it's a question that uh, I'd like you all to sort of address, but, you know, in a fairly short space of time, so we get to hear from all of you uh, very quickly. Um, and the question is, it's really simple. Why do you collect? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I think a uh, collector has an obligation to preserve the cultural capital of a nation. Yeah. Uh, especially in my case, why I because I collect uh, media art and new media art, and we know that the market uh, doesn't like media art. They are still into painting and sculpture, and I think at least one person has to collect the artwork produced by the artist, and this is, I think, yeah, one of the important uh, motivation for me to do. Just checking, can everybody hear? You can hear us? Yeah, that's great. Maybe oh, just have yeah. the mic okay. a bit closer to your, yeah. your lips, okay. thank you. Um, I think when we started collecting art, we didn't have a reason first and then we started collecting. It, it's really uh, picking up a few pieces and then more pieces and more pieces. But after a while, you do ask yourself and you, you, know, you, you spend a lot of time and money into this and you ask yourself, why do you collect? I think really the, the reason that, that would sustain us and would keep us continuing to collect is that it, it tells us about the world around us. It says things which cannot be said in, in words or in, in uh, music or in literature. It, it speaks to that part of us which is not well articulated in daily life, but uh, comes to us when we see an artwork and it reflects something very real and then you feel that your life is enhanced by, by having this, strangely, this object in your life. Lishu? Uh. I think collecting is about passion. It's a very personal thing. Um, there's only a handful of people who I think can fully commit and dedicate their life and time and energy into collecting. There's, uh, there's all kinds of collections out there, but I think 
um, and different motivations, but if you want to call a collection a real collection, you really have to put your personal passion, all of your personal passion inside. And it has nothing to do with money or fame or anything else. It's about your personal exploration and looking inside of yourself. Okay, that's great. Um, so it's all about personal narratives uh, and passion. I can hear you saying that. And uh, were you interesting, you said it's an obligation. So uh, this is where we get to the next question, which is, um, so what do you collect? What drives you uh, in, in terms of, you know, trying to tell your personal narrative, to try to fulfill your passion? What are the things that uh, capture your attention? First of all, <coughs> over the years, like Cheryl also told you already, so over the years, I, uh, the passion of collecting art comes from uh, the fact that suddenly, uh, through artworks, I could see the world completely different. Yeah? Something that I have never thought before, and because you have to read something about an artwork, and then you think like, oh, the world is like this, and that is so fascinating for me always. Uh, that is one of the reasons, uh, <coughs> actually, uh, why I'm so passionate in collecting. Yeah, one of the reasons. Yeah. There are more. Yeah. <laughs> so very much our collection is um, Southeast Asian. There's a bit of Asian, there's a little bit of international, but very much it is Southeast Asian. I think. Uh, the size of our collection now and what we can collect, it, it makes most sense to do that. And, and because we, um, we feel that these are the stories that speak most to us, these are the themes around our lives, um, necessarily that makes the, the kind of things that, um, I mean, there aren't that many, so there'll be less people than if I collected international art. But certainly this is where uh, home is, this is where we, we live and experience things and the artwork tells us about, about our things. So for example, on the screen right now, whoops, <laughs> uh, the yellow one just before this and that is Li Wen, performance art and it's called The Yellow Man and very much he was talking about being Chinese in a very overt way where he splashed uh, yellow paint on himself so that he's uh, a real yellow man. But really just exploring what it means to be Chinese in multicultural Singapore, what it means to be Chinese when other people see you not as you, and not only as you, but as, as Chinese. And these are themes that really speak to uh, things that we experience or that we know uh, in, in everyday life. And so that's where our collection, you know, centers around. Was, well, what do you collect? I mean, um, it's interesting. I was just talking to Ellen at Survey earlier. He says, is it just about acquiring objects uh, or is it more than that? And I'm hearing that, of course, it's a lot more than that. It's about driving your personal narrative. And you talked about passion earlier. Well, I started by just collecting and acquiring objects. That's how everybody starts. And then after uh, acquiring a certain amount of works, we started the museum, which is in, back in 2013. And after that, because it's a private museum, uh, we, we do, of course, we do public shows and I also show, uh, showcase my collection. And also there's curated shows, group and solo exhibitions of, 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 of projects of artists. Uh, I find myself more and more um, interlinking between the programs at the museum and the collection. So sometimes you can see that the collect, uh, part of the collection is the origin of a show and then sometimes a show things from the show becomes part of the collection so it's very interesting uh, relationship between the programs i have in the museum and i think that's also that's a, that's the only way you can achieve by having a private museum because probably in western countries the uh, the public museum take two different very two different directions with their program and the collection and uh, probably done by different people but for for the for my private initiative, it's practically the same the the same thing. So I find myself less and less uh, just looking at a work by itself. But I'm always so I don't like buy on the spot anymore. Um, it's always about long conversations, talking about projects, getting to know artists, getting to know their um, practices uh, now or in the future uh, future plannings, uh, and that comes into solo projects, residency projects, 
or acquisition. So it becomes a more multifaceted pra uh, practice. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So I mean, you're you're all motivated by different things. You've all got a great collection of things that are, are quite different from the next person. Um, and I guess my question being, you know, it's an expensive enterprise, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of money that goes into uh, building a collection. So how do you know um, that what you're building is worthwhile, firstly? Um, secondly, you know, is still reflects your tastes in about 10 years' time. I mean, we were talking a little bit earlier. Do you ever have buyer's remorse uh, or over collections or, or works that you've purchased? Um, so, so how do you go about building something coherent that sort of reflects um, your sort of zeitgeist and your sort of personal narrative? So in my case, I want to uh, share with you, uh, I've been collecting almost 20 years now. At the beginning, I always, when I want to buy an artwork, I always thought like, uh, will I lose the money? Is it worth to buy? Uh, is it a good artist? Uh, will he be a superstar one day? Yeah, and so a lot of questions like that. And that's always related to the commercial value, right? So I'm very blessed that today I managed to put aside the questions of money completely. So when I see a, uh, an artwork, uh, I don't ask anymore. Uh, whether the artist has been exhibiting in MoMA or in any museum, whether he had a good school or not, and uh, whether he will be a superstar, and whether he will only produce this artwork, a good artwork, this one, and later on crabs. Uh, it doesn't matter for me, as long as the artwork is good, as long as it matches coherently into my collection, co co coherent is very important, as long as it matches my collection, and I always imagine myself, if I buy this artwork and I would display it in my office, does it make my collection stronger? That's are the three questions that I always ask, and if yes, then I will buy. If the artist will die tomorrow or doesn't produce artwork anymore, I don't care. Yeah, so uh, the commercial, uh, stuff is not relevant anymore for me. Yeah. <coughs> so this is, uh, and I feel very happy with that. So, yeah. I, I think one of the reasons why my husband and I are great art collecting friends with Wii U is that we agree on this particular point. I think that not everything can be measured in, in cost. Uh, things have value which don't have price. And, and so when you pick an artwork and when you buy it, uh, you can really only regret it on certain dimensions. You, you, you can't really regret it on price because you're right, it's an awful lot of money and no amount of financial in your brain will ever make it worth it. Um, but you can always regret something that you bought that, has, um, that doesn't really speak to you. Something that you bought because you thought that it would make you look better. Something that you bought because you felt obliged to or you weren't really thinking through it. And those things are, are real regrets, which uh, have no price, but uh, cost a lot. I agree. <laughs> uh, so market value, you talk, ex you're saying art is expensive, but in my mind, it, the, the money is not the value of an art, art piece. So that's two completely different things. So if everybody buys for investment or the market value, then everyone will have the same collection, we, as we've discussed. Everyone want to support the same artist. The artist price goes up. But, uh, but there's all kinds of different artists in art, uh, practicing in our times that are equally important or equally the good quality. So, and they're probably not, so yeah, but this is a big thing, talking about money, <laughs> the value of a work and value of a, a market value. But that's, yeah. I think we would be lying if we, we said it never crossed our minds and we do not hope that our, <laughs> our art goes up in value. 
but I think as a primary motivation, it, it's very dangerous. I think also um, we were talking about how some collections are so-called better or more enjoyable. And, and really the thing that makes a collection enjoyable is when you can see the collector's uh, passion, can see the collector's personal interests, personal narrative, personal sort of taste in it. And that makes it a really good collection. Um, I mean, when, when I go to see, I think when, when we you goes to see, then we are interested in that individuality that you, you cannot find when you just have a big name, big name, big name plastered on the wall. And those are the most valuable collections, um, but not, not really the, the things that, that would interest you, that, you would, that I would want to own, actually. I'm happy to see them in the museum. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I love what you've brought up there. The idea that if you were in it for the money and you're in it for the investment side of things, everybody would be buying the same thing. Um, Damien Hirst, anyone? You know, it's, it's all gone down in value, uh, quite a few of his pieces. And uh, so it's really interesting that this is somebody who was reaching all kinds of records at the height of the financial crisis, and yet 10 years plus later, it's not giving you the same kind of returns. Please do. So <clears throat> let's say uh, I would like to uh, mention an example. You buy an artwork for let's say one hundred thousand dollar, and then after five years, the commercial value increased to five hundred thousand. Uh, usually, a lot of collectors feel uh, validated and always say, oh, "When I bought it, it was still so affordable, and now, and now you know it's so expensive. I have a good collection, yeah." And then in most of the cases, in most of the cases. After it reached 500,000, it goes down to 50,000 under your buying price. And most of the collector will hide their artworks in the warehouse, right? We know, we know it. So the question is actually, yeah, what was wrong? The artwork is still the same, the color has not faded, right? And the artist still producing artworks very well. And as a collector, I did nothing wrong. What was wrong? From being a good collector, I become a lousy collector. So wrong is you use the wrong validation method. You use the money to validate an artwork, right? That, that is, I think, something that we have really to put aside and don't be influenced by money. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, yeah, that is so important, I think, for, for collectors, yeah. I, so can I just add that the, the converse is also true, that if you bought Damon Hurst because you saw something in him, if you believed in his message and you realized that he reflected the time that he made that shark, if you believed in it and you bought it and now the price is down and the shark is rotting, it doesn't make you a bad collector at all. I, I like Damien Hurst. I don't own any of it, but I like it. I know the price has gone down. But, but I think... Um, it, it works both ways. Yeah. If the price goes up, it doesn't mean you're good. If the price goes down, yeah. it doesn't mean you're bad as well. And you can still, and that's the best part. If you didn't look at the price, you would exactly. still enjoy yeah. it as much. It would be as meaningful. Um, it would be a lot more trouble to look after that shark, but it would be as yeah. meaningful yeah. as the day you bought it. General consensus from everyone here, yeah. a show of hands, you all agree? <laughs> yeah? Okay, so you really got to love the it. Converter. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> And uh, I guess my next question is, um, is just what we, we kind of touched on it a little earlier. I know, Lucian, you've got a, a, the Sifang Art uh, Collective that you have and you show to the public this notion of uh, public versus private. So we know, Cheryl, we, you, you've all got these great collections, but we're going to have to be your really good friends to come over and see them, right? So this notion that... This amazing collection of artworks are being shuttered away from public view is, is a bit disturbing to many of us. You know, we'd love to see your collections, but how do we see your collections? Lushun, you've obviously got your museum in, in Nanjing. It's beautiful. Uh, I think we're seeing some um, photos that have been going around the loop where you can see some of this amazing stuff. Um, so the notion that, you know, you're, you're hiding this away from us. Come on, we want to see it. Um, Guilty it's as controversial. <laughs> so how do you justify that? So I, I think when we, we started out, we certainly never started out thinking of ourselves as art collectors. So now that we actually have an art collection, uh, we don't have a, a sort of platform to make it public. I would say that we... 
this morning I opened my, my house, my collection to open house, courtesy of C Focus. <laughs> um, and so that's to us, that's one platform that we're happy to open up. Uh, we're always happy to meet other collectors and just show it. They don't have to be our really good friends. But even if you did, uh, I think we're fairly friendly, so it's quite easy to be our good friends. Um, but the other thing, I, I think, thinking about making a permanent public space to, to show your art, I think, um, in a way, it's, it's an aspirational thing. Uh, you know, it, it would be nice, it would be great if I had a, a private museum, but I, I think one of the things, I mean, sort of logistics and resources aside, one of the things that I think about when I think about making a, a private museum is, is really what's the, the long term. I want to share my art. I, I feel that it's something that, ha that I enjoy a lot. John and I enjoy it a lot. It's something we want to share. You, you, just can't, you just can't help it. You, you want to see the enjoyment it might give to other people, the things that it might add to other people's lives. Um, but I'm not sure right now if a museum in the longer run is, is the platform for us. Yeah, so that, that's something um, I would maybe, I would have to think through because I, I think uh, as, a pri as a public space, then museums are not the only way to share, uh, share art. Lucian, you have a museum, so how often do you have uh, the public going in? How um, often do you show? I agree with Cheryl that uh, for a collection, a space is not necessary. There's all kinds of ways, because collection is the essence, right? It's the works that you own. And uh, there's all kinds of ways to activate your collection. And I would actually prefer different collectors approaching their collection in different ways. So either it's a private home, or you invite artists to work on your collection and make other works, or you do small projects, because having a, a private museum is a large undertaking, and it's really a personal decision on whether or not you, wanna, you want to do that. And it's about where you are. Like for me, I think for Nanjing, it's a uh, contemporary scene is not so vibrant. So if I do it, I will be the only one and first one to do it. I think that's, you know, that makes a lot of sense for us. But also, I think in Hong Kong, in Singapore, there's many good collections. And uh, it really depends on what the collector wants to do with their, uh, you need to be creative about it, right? Because every, everybody has their own collection. And uh, um, I've, seen, I've seen really, really interesting conceptual collections. So the, the basically the idea of how one person collects is a concept. And uh, that, that's really interesting. It doesn't have to be in a space. It could be a dinner. It could be anything, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I highly respect private collectors like Lu Sun who share his collection to the public. And I also believe that good artworks have to be shared with as, ma as many people as possible. Uh, and today, a lot of government funding is cut in a lot of countries. And I think private collection can help to fill the gap and to make the cultural landscape better of a city, of a nation. Uh, everything is perfect, but I want to share with you some critical thinkings of building a private museum. First, in a lot of countries, in developing, con uh, sorry, in developing countries, uh, buying a piece of land and building a house, uh, my, uh, mostly it is a good investment. You will not lose any money, okay? And then, <clears throat> If you do good branding, a lot of advertisement about your private museum, then you can go to the gallery and buy an artwork with discount. Let's say 30% 30 30 discount because um, uh, yeah, famous museum, right? So let's say you would invest $100 million. Instead, you just spend 70000 And after two decades or one decade, and then you will sell the artworks. And the artwork has a good provenance because it's a museum piece. And according to the statistic, you will sell it 20% above a normal artwork without good provenance. So that means you spend 70 million, you sell it for 120, right? So you make a profit of $50 million easily. 
So what I want to say is, building a private museum can be not you, okay? Yeah. So no, 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 no. I mean, I'm not addressing you. Just, uh, just normal uh, about. Building a private museum can be a smart investment. The collector get branded and makes 50 million bucks money. And he can hire a curator, famous museum director to get branded, right? So we have to be aware of it. Not all private museum has a program like uh, Nanfang, uh, Sifang Museum and so on and provide residencies. No, a lot of people are into making money. I'm very sure, okay? This is a something that we have to be aware of. Not every private museum is private museum that we wish to have. So the second point is I think we have uh, to think, uh, let, let's say, uh, artworks is uh, a museum is actually a trustee of a nation's cultural capital. So the curators chooses the artworks and preserve it in a museum. And then they do research into the artwork and they, they present it to the public so the next generation can appreciate what has happened, right? And we know it from the past, from 20th century, that even the highly educated curators in the Western world, they have made a collective mistake. All of them, at the same time, what was it? Only 5% of the artworks in Western museums are made by male artists, right? The female artists were not chosen by the museum. That's a mistake of the Western public museums, right? So building a museum is a weighty has a weighty responsibilities. The question is, if you have a private museum, can you fulfill these responsibilities better than the public museums in the United States and uh, in, in, in Europe, where they were highly educated and still made mistakes. Another mistake is, uh, I think 20% of the nudes were female. Yeah, uh, are you <laughs> just, just a joke, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah. And uh, they chose it because female. So uh, if the private collectors who built a private museum just chose the artwork because he likes it, doesn't see it as a strong responsibility, as a trustees for a nation, then we have to ask ourselves, do we allow the taste of a private collector to be written in an art, art history, right? So a lot of collectors have a weird taste, yeah? I mean, uh, we don't know whether it is a good art or not, but it seems like weird for us. Uh, maybe <laughs> it will turn out to be the right one to collect and ours is weird. So, but I mean, uh, a lot of collectors uh, has a different taste. If they build a museum and brand it and becomes the place to go if you visit the city and that will be written in the art history, do you think that we would allow it? Yeah. And the third point is, uh, if I would have a private museum uh, in certain countries, not in China, and uh, in certain countries, you can donate your collection into your own private museum and then tax deductible, right? And you still keep the artworks. Fantastic. I buy 20 million artworks and then donate to my museum, still see it every day, and then it's still mine. But you're cheating your countrymen. They are working very hard, yeah, and pay the tax, and then the tax is going to your pocket to buy artworks. I mean, uh, there are some critical points that we have to be aware if we heard about private museum. Yeah, and a lot of other, I have to shut my mouth. I mean, because we are Asian, we don't like to be criticized, right? We always want to have uh, people uh, telling good stories about us. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, I, I, I think, Cheryl, Cheryl, you wanted to add to that? No, I, I'm just thinking along that, that lines that sometimes both public and private museums, they, they both run risks of asserting a, a, a narrative which is too dominant, which means they are telling people what is good art. I think that if, if you're, um, it's harder in a public institution because there's more consensus, there's more transparency, it's easier in a private institution where a lot of it is, is made out of one person's opinion. 
Um, but if you're a good museum, whether public or private, then really what you're doing is allowing people to form their own tastes, form their own narratives, you're giving them information, you're empowering them, and in that way, you're allowing them to enjoy art better in, in their own way. And so I, I don't think it's all about public or private, but really the, the institution needs to be very clear um, about their, their goals and, and how they do it and the, the possible pitfalls because I, I'm sure um, public museums know all about tax deductible as well and, and they use it to their, their own advantage I and mean, why not? Now these are all great points that you bring up and, and, and Lucien, as the only one with a, a private <laughs> museum collection that is publicly accessible what do you have to say about you know, the kind of social responsibility that you have to display the, the right works that have some kind of message to the public? Um, you know that the private museums in China, there are about four or five of them. Of them. They started the, the more important ones today. They started around the same time, around 2013, 2012, 2014, so around those three years. Um, they used the long um, Times Museum a bit earlier, UCC a bit earlier, but most of them started in uh, 2013, 2012. That's when, there is when, at a time that in China is quite necessary because in China there's no public institutions dedicated to contemporary art. There's only one called the Power Station of, uh, of, of, of Art, a PSA in Shanghai, but it doesn't have a collection. So, so basically, um, you have this many contemporary artists creating um, interesting and important works that of today, but they're not being studied or preserved or collected systematically anywhere in China. We have two of the biggest collections in China, but collected by foreigners um, in, the, in the early 2000s. So it's quite a, quite a big obligation for for us Chinese to kind of come out and say, we'll do the work for the public museum. Probably they're going to come in 10, 20 years. When government realizes that this is of value, there's going to be more public institutions and they're going to start collecting. We have, of course, we have great antique museums, ink painting museums, public museums of, of this kind, but never contemporary art. Uh, so it was a time of demand, it was a time of need that it has, it had to be done. Um, so there's really nothing you can compare it in terms of Chinese context because if I would compare Chinese private museum to Western public museum, I would I will agree with those two just said that we're actually a bit more flexible. So we can do a bit more what we want to do and less bureaucracy and we're actually, we react faster um, M plus used to say that all the work are collected by private collectors <laughs> too fast because they, they need to go through a very long process when they want to acquire something. Um, so we, yeah, so we do have good collections in China now and, um, and who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? They might come together, they might be, <laughs> fall apart, uh, but I would prefer them to, 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 to come together, you know, so essentially you're saying that the, the, the state, I mean, you've all brought it up. Uh, we're very lucky here in Singapore that this is a, a state that uh, supports the arts. So there is, you know, great collections that are accessible to most of the public, I would think, uh, compared to other countries where, you know, you've got much more of an emerging market. You know, the state isn't there. So therefore, private collectors, corporate collectors have to step in to, you know, create a, uh, a collection that will be accessible to the public. So what do you think about the corporate side of things? Because oftentimes there's a certain profit element. You know, we, you, you talked about the tax exemptions. I mean, presumably this is also happening with the corporate collections. So tell us a little bit about the dichotomy there. Is that something that you worry about? I think I'll, I'll stay out of this because <laughs> <laughs> we're very much personal do they, do they do, I mean, you know, they're serving a purpose, right? You've talked about this very important purpose of educating the public who may not be aware of contemporary art. So, you know, educating someone like me uh, about contemporary art, I, I, you know, I'd love to be able to see collections that I think are relevant, that are making people talk, that, uh, you know, are generally liked. So 
Where, you know, where, where should I go to see them? Do I go to um, a public museum, private museum, a corporate collection? What's the best, or is it a combination of all three? I think if you, if you are a real collector, then you, you go to as many as you can. You, you go to everything, you see everything, you keep an open mind, and, and then you, you make your own cause. You, you cannot collect like a, a public museum in Singapore. You should not collect like your favorite private collector ever. Um, and, and you should make, uh, I think the best collection is when you really, um, you decide on something, you've learned a lot from other people, but you decide on something that which, is, which is really yours. And then you go about with a lot of effort, a lot of time, and you build your own private collection. Uh, and yeah, I think that's. So time has become so precious. We traveled so much for art that our own business becomes neglected. So, and, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we generate less income and cannot buy artworks anymore. So I think uh, if I have a choice to see private museum, uh, private collection or public museums, I prefer to see private. Yeah. So because private uh, collection is always for me uh, mystical. So you see a collection, when I was in Alang Sove collections last year, uh, stunning collection, you have to go to Brussels to see his collection. Uh, cutting edge, uh, I was so happy uh, because you started to think what kind of person is he yeah, why he buy this? Yeah, and you know that most of the most of the contemporary artworks doesn't look pretty, and it's not pleasing the eyes. And then yeah, and then you see something like this, and then you think like, why he buy that? Yeah, and then you try to understand. Oh, he must be very smart or very intellectual. You know, and he must think in that direction. Yeah, I mean that are really really uh, challenging. And if you go to a public museum. This, this color doesn't exist. Yeah. I mean, stunning artworks, of course, museum pieces, but it doesn't generate the curiosity to know uh, what kind of person he is. This is what I enjoy. And mostly, of course, we like our collection the most, right? <laughs> you will say my thing better. I mean, I mean, then you should not be disappointed. Yeah, except uh, if he uh, collect colorful paddy field and flowers and, and horses and, and uh, koi fishes, and you will be disappointed. But, uh, but I mean, it's okay. But and then at least you know, oh, this, this, <laughs> this is a collector that uh, uh, ignorant. He doesn't try to, uh, to, to refine his taste, to, to get more knowledge, right? So uh, then this is also a lesson for us, right? Yeah. I, I think because, I should speak because up bad for taste, Because bad taste, <laughs> Bad taste is, is a representation of ignorance, right? If you meet people, yeah, you see an artwork and you say, I uh, like it. What, and then what someone if I like koi fish? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you see an artwork and then an art expert tell you, oh, you, this is not good because, and then you have to listen because he is knowledgeable than you. And then after that, a lot of people say, oh, but I still like it. I, I buy what I like. Yeah? And these people will keep his bad taste. Right, so even after 30 years, he still. Be, uh, sorry, uh, so I'm Asian. I have to Great shut my mouth. Pressure, okay. you know. Yeah. I mean, like I mean, uh, I mean we, we might all have really yeah. bad taste. Yeah. So I'm getting really Don't worried show about you this. You're quite Very fish. subjective. <laughs> <laughs> but this is true, right? So we we have to be open-minded, always to learn and adjust, and yeah, and then our collection becomes better. Learning is a journey. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, you can you can like anything, and you can have your own personal motivations for all these things. But being close-minded, um, being very fixed, and over five years, ten years, collecting absolutely the same thing, and then saying, "Well, this is good contemporary art." I think this is. I mean, then then you you figure out you've got a problem because contemporary art really needs to reflect reflect its times, and times change. And, and as a good collector, you should uh, be able to sense that and then be willing and brave enough to stop buying what you used to buy and look at other things. And I think that's where the, the interest and enjoyment and variety comes from. Now, we've got about 20 minutes. You've got, you guys have been a great audience, I have to say. You're all paying attention. You've been very wrapped with uh, what they have to say. And, you know, they, they know what they're talking about. They have good taste, right? <laughs> so... 
Yeah, we'd we'll love fish. to get questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? There's a roving mic, so please, uh, please do ask. Yeah. One right at the front. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, thank you because for us that we are Westerns, to see the level of, of reasoning being a collector and, and, and how mature is your way of collecting is, is really something. We don't listen that, that much good speech in Western conferences. So my question is, um, uh, what is the, 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 the role of a collector as a mentor? Like, you know, sometimes young collectors, uh, for them is so important not only to see your collections but to ask you questions and and actually I guess maybe you had some mentor so for me it will be interesting to, to for you to tell me if if you have any mentor or you just were uh, researchers on your own or and if you have many people particularly in China and so there's in the whole South Asia now young people interested in starting collecting and approaching you so I'll ask you all to turn around now and leaning against that pillar there is a guy in the <laughs> army green t-shirt and, and that's Mr. Yip Lan Yang. And uh, my husband John and I have been very fortunate to have learned a lot for, about collecting from him. Um, really, he, he teaches and he, he's taught us through many, many conversations over the years. <laughs> sufu, sufu. Um, he, he, I think mentors are important. They, they teach you um, not what to collect. And really, when you have somebody um, more experienced than you and coming up to you and telling you, you know, I bought this and you should buy this too, because, you know, I, I think that's not really what mentoring is about. Mentoring is really introducing you to the whole uh, scene, sometimes to methods, sometimes to people, sometimes to, to places or, or little tips and tricks. But a lot of times, always thinking about you, always thinking, what do I know from 20 years of collecting that this guy needs to know, that I wish I had known earlier, and just being very, very generous and very, very thoughtful about the things that they, they say to you. And so I, I think John and I have been very fortunate to have Mr. Yip in our, in our collecting lives. And he's got a book as well, didn't he? He gave Lucian a book. We'd love to see it later on. <laughs> yeah. So I don't have a mentor, but I believe in books. I'm a scholar. So, and I think someone, if someone write a book and it is published, uh, it should be maybe 80% okay. Yeah. So <laughs> if you meet a collector who has been collecting 30 years, but mostly he collect modernism, and he will tell me a lot about modernist art which is not applicable because I collect contemporary art, right? So it ends up that I think like, no, you have to rely on books only, and I read contemporary art theory books, and this is the only source how I come forward over the years. So, uh, I mean, the, most, the biggest mistake is for beginners, if someone fall in love the first piece, uh, in the first piece of artwork, and then he goes to the bookstores and buy books. A lot of books, and I bet with you, he will buy Picasso, right? He will buy Picasso and all the 20th century art. He will read every day, and after 20 books, he say, I'm an expert in art. And he forgot that the books he read is modernist art, 20th century art, right? And the time has changed. We are living in a contemporary art era, yeah? And then he used the knowledge of modern art to choose contemporary art. Yeah, and, and you know the result, right? So uh, it cannot be good. So it has, you have to read books, the real contemporary art books. And I don't read books that describe certain artworks only, because we have limited time. If you read, keep on reading books from this artist, this artwork, it's very difficult to understand. So that's why I read contemporary art theory, to give you an understanding about why contemporary art was born in the 60s, what is contemporary? If you ask your friends, what is contemporary? So uh, they have difficulties in answering that question, right? And then, and, and all these basic questions, and after you, you understood that, oh, contemporary art came at that time because of this and that condition, wow, and then you can apply this knowledge for every exhibition in the world. You go in and then, wow, you know, and you can read every artworks, yeah. Uh, more easily, yeah. 
than if you would only understand each of the artworks. Yeah. <coughs> Sounds really hard. <laughs> you know, it's like you've got to read. You've got to know what you're looking for. Yeah, wow. Can, can I just yeah. say that um, if you want to know about art, then you can't just read art books. And really, art reflects uh, life and history and human thought. And sometimes a lot, of, I mean, actually a lot of times I learn more about art from reading non-art uh, non books. But, but the other thing I want to say is that we, you, you are an art mentor, aren't you? <laughs> now, this is an interesting question. Is art collecting an intellectual uh, experience or is it a sensory experience? Yeah. <laughs> Sensory, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go on. Uh, well, actually, I wanted to hear from Lucien as well. I mean, you, you're on the advisory board for the Tate and, and all of that, so, you know, it's really interesting <laughs> that, um, you know, you've been quietly listening. Mentor how do you for, learn? Uh, for me, I, I find myself mentored mostly by artists. Yeah. I really value your artist opinions on many things. Um, yeah. And I can find out about an artist from listening to what his opinions of, of older or more classical artists are. So it's, it's a two-way conversation. It's very interesting hearing about other artists talking about other, other artists. <laughs> so <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. And I believe there's a question. Yeah, Benedicta. Um. First, I'd like to uh, challenge the word taste or, or good art or bad art. I think it can be nerve-wracking, weeping, I don't know, disgusting. I, I try to collect that kind, you know, I, I try more to, to have a visceral relationship. Um, I was mentored by a Brazilian a gallerist, very famous uh, in Latin America. And uh, when we looked at art, he always said something that came still comes to my mind, he, says, he, he looked at the artist and said, you're good, but you don't fill my holes. So each one of us has different holes to fill. So each of our collections has our own personal, which doesn't mean it's good or bad, uh, but at the end of the day, when you're making a decision of buying a piece, uh, you're confronting the, the decision to yourself. And, and sometimes you do need I, at least for me, I need sounding boards, and so many times I don't have them because I collect by myself. So I don't. You collect, yeah. With my husband, yes. So what happens? You have to believe in yourself as well, in a way. Do you disagree with your husband? This All is really interesting. It's like a partnership, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you guys always agree on pieces? Uh, we have we. We very seldom totally agree on pieces right at the right at the onset, um, but. You know, we've been married, this year will be 19 years, so we're still together and hey, it's possible for your marriage to survive quarreling over art purchases. <laughs> um, but, but it's part of the process. Um, we, we talk about the art pieces we like, we don't like, why, why not. Um, it's not entirely logical, there's a lot of emotional blackmailing both ways. <laughs> but I mean, art collecting is so much more than looking at, at art. It, it, it has, I think, in many ways, become an activity that we enjoy together. Yeah. So back to your uh, mentor, uh, I have put a photo of a Raphael Renaissance paintings. Uh, if people would ask in the Western world, yeah, in the Western world, what was the art in 15th century? There is only one answer: Renaissance. At that time, if you were an artist and you didn't paint Renaissance, you were forgotten by the mankind. Only the artists who did paintings like that is considered to be good artists. Good or bad, did do exist. Yeah? But it needs time. So the question is, why only Renaissance? Because at that time, people start to believe that the center of life is human being. Not Jesus anymore, not the church anymore, just like in the Gothic period before, where all the painting depicting mother and child. So and in Renaissance painting, you see the normal people in the painting. And at the same time, 1453, there is a, a slide that I put. 
Leon Battista Alberti invented the linear perspective. For the first time, artists could depict the so-called visual space on a, two, a flat dimensional canvas. That's why all the painting in Renaissance depict the room. Because they were so fascinated that that could produce a room in a plan two-dimensional surface. See the painting, everything depicting. And this linear perspective was a, an invention in the Western world, conquered the Western art for f nearly 500 years. Until uh, Paul Cezanne, uh, George Braque, and Picasso broke the road, this rule. So it was a bombastic invention. And again, the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time at that time was humanism. So you have to collect artworks that conform to the spirit of the time. In 50 years, your personal taste, nobody talk about. You never see a collection in a museum with Renaissance painting and say, that belongs to that baron or that belongs to that church. That's why it is important. No, they never talk about it, right? Personal is gone later on. Nobody talk about it. Uh, sorry, it's my, per, my personal opinion, right? So that's why I strongly believe in uh, first part, uh, first half of 19th century, it was romantic because the concept of individuum was invented. In the second half of 19th century, it was impressionist. If you ask what was the art or oh, impressionism, and the name were all the friends. Why friends? Because camera was invented in France. The invention of camera produced a completely new artworks called Impressionism. So the zeitgeist is so important because, you know, the zeitgeist, uh, the spirit of the time has changed, and we always have to buy the artwork that relate to the zeitgeist. They will see it in 100 years back to 2018, and they will say, at that time, people live in that and that condition, social, political, and whatever condition. And if your artwork doesn't reflect this zeitgeist, the collection is crap. Yeah, very easily. That's why nobody can tell the, whether my collection is good or bad, right? Later, the time will tell the truth. Yeah. That is really, I mean, that is such a, a profound statement that, you know, you, your, ref, your collection has to reflect the zeitgeist of the time. Again, a great deal of responsibility, yeah. uh, a, a great deal of work that goes into it. So, so what reflects the zeitgeist? of this time, or do we only really know it 100 years from no, now? later. Because zeitgeist you've got cannot be say zeitgeist is. <laughs> that is completely wrong. But zeitgeist is always the zeitgeist was. But we know yeah. we live in a digital, uh, you know, it's a digitized era, you've got AI exactly. and yeah. various things, and you yeah. have a great so collection of a lot of new yeah. media, yeah. Yeah. I, right? I postulate digitalization will be seen as zeitgeist, globalization that has changed significantly our life, the entire world, will be seen as zeitgeist, urbanization, and environmental issue, right? So, because for the first time, people started to realize that we are destroying our planet. Uh, actually, we are destroying ourselves because the planet will survive. So, we are living in a new era called Anthropocene. That means human influence the world so strongly yeah, everything happened is influenced by also environment and weather is everything is influenced by human being so and that's why i think i collect artworks related with this topic yeah. maybe i'm wrong and then my my grandchildren will say uh, opa so dumb yeah i mean it's okay yeah. cheryl lushun <laughs> you agree you tend to collect stuff that reflects the era uh, I think nowadays artists are more personal. So I, I don't know if an artist makes a work, he thinks about whether or not his work will be remembered or will represent the era. So not necessarily. I'm, not say, I'm, I'm saying not necessarily. I'm giving you a counter statement, but not saying I'm not, I don't agree with you. Um, you might have an artist living in the middle of Pakistan, Mongolia, making amazing work that has nothing to do with the time. I think that could also be possible. Because nowadays, people are m just... I think people are less 
together, but more apart. Even we have like mobile devices, everything linking us together, but I think each one has a more independent uh, capability to, to, to do things. So that's also what I think today's art making is interesting. Can't say that it's good or bad. His time will tell, but uh, uh, for me, as long as the work is interesting, it's genuine, it's genuine to the artist, it's emotional, it's it's you know it's real. Then I would I would say it's a good work. Yeah, I would say good work. But not all good works will be remembered. So that's the thing. <laughs> so well, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. So we've got about five minutes left. I guess my question now would be: in a hundred years time, how would you like your collections to be remembered? Um, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, that last thing about, about the, the zeitgeist because I think it's important, but like we use says, it's not something that you should bear in mind. I feel that it's not something that you need to bear in mind and every time you see it artwork, you, you sort of question yourself, does it reflect the times? Will it be remembered in, in 100 years? That's just way too much thinking. Um, very much you should have some confidence in yourself as a person of the times and you are a product of the times and so if you follow something that is real, and, and like he says, really looking not just at the artwork, at the form, but at the idea. And I like very much what he said about the individual. A lot of art that uh, John and I have collected over the, first, or the last 10 years has really been uh, political art in Southeast Asia. And a lot of political action is, is social. It's coming together. It's working for a cause and things like that. But after, so, so last year we had a show on at, at La Salle ICA. And after that, and that was like a big milestone for us. And then we asked, or I asked myself, um, where's the collection going after this? Are we going to continue collecting in this vein? And I think it is very much about the individual, that the Anthropocene that we go into, that the decades that are going to follow, um, are a time where we don't look at people so much as, as big sort of groups, and we don't have to, and we don't have to think about countries. And, and groups of people thinking in a particular way that um, a lot of us in our daily lives uh, assert an individuality that is much more acceptable nowadays. It's much more acceptable just to be quirky and you and to post your own pictures. You don't have to make a great work of art. And, and very much I think that might be a, a theme for us uh, going forward too. It, it's a bit paradoxical, a collection that reflects individuality but I, I think that's one of the, the things that I see uh, coming forward. I would answer your questions in negated form. My, the, the nightmare for me is if I would die one day and I have two kids and if they don't like my collection, uh, it's their right, and, they want, and then they want to sell it and nobody want it, right? Then that is a nightmare, <laughs> right? Because as a, I mean, uh, as an Asian Chinese, we are influenced by uh, Confucius. Yeah, they may not throw it away because it brings back luck, and then they will keep it. They will keep it in the rest uh, in the warehouse because they don't want to see it. And maybe they will pray every day that termite will destroy the collection, and they have reason to throw it away. Right? That is a nightmare. That should not happen as a collector. Yeah. <laughs> Unless there's any last questions, yes. Hello. Just one thing, because you're, you're talking about speaking to young collectors. Um, it's the end of uh, C Focus, and something I would like to say to young collectors, um, I've been very impressed by what you said. I mean, really, um, is don't look at the West anymore. Um, I mean, you have everything you need. You have the art you need. You have the collectors you need. Um, we started uh, traveling to, the, um, to Asia because um, we were tired of the way money has been polluting completely the Western art market. Um, so all I wanted to say as a conclusion at 2 minutes and 35 seconds is um, congratulations for, for this talk. It was really amazing. It's a super high quality. It must be uh, put online and listened. Um, 
and to the people of the audience, if it was still the case, um, don't look at the West, uh, because the West has got to learn from you and not the, not the reverse. That's what I wanted just to add. Great last words. Um, but actually, I do want to hear some final thoughts from each of you, which is, you know, and it reflects on the question that was earlier, you know, young collectors today trying to build a collection. What would you say are your, very quickly, 30 seconds each, top tips in building a collection? Don't think too much, buy, right? <laughs> That's, now, yeah, a lot of people say, oh, maybe I will buy the wrong piece. You will always buy the wrong piece. <laughs> so you just buy because I make, a, yeah, I make an experience. If somebody bought the first piece, and the fire start burning. They, they, she will feel like, oh, I'm a collector now, right? And then that is a good starting point. Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing is, is really honesty. And that's honesty from yourself of why you're buying art, why you're collecting, why you like this piece. And I think you should also demand honesty from the artists that you should be able to see not only in their artist statement but in the object in front of you that they are sincere, that they meant what they say, they are really interested in this thing that they've made uh, art about. And, and when you, you find these two things, then you, you can't go wrong and even if the market is against you, you still enjoy it very much. <laughs> a bit of museum. <laughs> I would say really trust the artist and try to understand the artist. Because we're nothing without the artist, right? We're only following what the artists do. And if we, uh, the least we can do is support them for what they want to do. But if, if we don't have good artists, then what we're doing here, right? When I was saying that uh, it, sh it should not be one West, West copy China, uh, Asia or Asia copy West, it should be in the, in learning from each other. Like, I was looking at the minimalist show today, right? Because they took a lot of philosophies from Eastern Zen, you know. But I think it was a time when they didn't actually have direct contact with e Eastern philosophy. So they were actually very independent in the, in the States, so making great works as an artist, not as theorist or anything else. And Monaha was looking at you know, American art, and they're being independent, although borrowing some ideas. So that, I think, is what's lacking today, because we get information so fast. Young artists can look at another country's young artists, very real work, very quickly and easily, and it's very difficult to be independent. Also for collector, you know, we're talking to collectors from all over the world, and it's very difficult to be independent. And that's, I think, the most important thing, is you want to cultivate your own. And, and you should always do that. Every single country it should not be globalized, I, I think. I think even for the fairs, the fairs bring convenience to collectors. So we don't have to walk too far to see <laughs> art. But I think what would be a great idea is, is we collectors, we go to the end of the world to see things, instead of things being brought to us. So, yeah. Wonderful, thank you all. Uh, Cheryl Lo, Wei Yu Wahono, Lu Xun, you were all great. And hopefully we've all learned something here. We've all learned how to uh, gain some good taste. Thank you all. <laughs>